What's doing, everybody? Welcome to episode 741 of First Class Fatherhood. I'm happy and honored, as always, to be here with you guys. Thank you for tuning in. And man, have I got an incredible guest to bring you guys today. Legendary boxer Andre Ward joins me on the podcast today. Andre Ward retired from the sport of boxing with an unblemished 32-0 record. He walked away from the game he loves with an undefeated record. He was a world champion in two weight classes, super middleweight and light heavyweight. First class father, world class boxer. He would go on to be inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2021. Now, prior to turning pro in 2004, Andre Ward won the Olympic gold medal in Athens in the 2004 Summer Olympics. And has it been an easy road for him? Absolutely not. The only thing more incredible than his boxing career is his story, which he tells now in a new book that he's got out, Killing the Image, A Champion's Journey of Faith, Fighting, and Forgiveness. And here is the book right here, Killing the Image. The link to the book is down there in the description below. Grab yourself a copy. Buy one for a friend. If you got a family member that loves the sport of boxing, get them this book. It's out and available now. Andre Ward is going to be here with me in just a few minutes, so please stick around for the interview. And I have had quite a few other boxers join me on the podcast today. One who was supposed to fight Andre Ward, Kelly Pavlik. He joined me on the podcast a while back. He was scheduled to fight Andre Ward back in 2013, uh, but due to injury, that fight never materialized. Kelly Pavlik ended up retiring. Would have loved to have seen that matchup. Other boxers on the podcast here include uh, James Buster Douglas, who knocked out Mike Tyson. I actually interviewed James Buster Douglas on the 30-year anniversary of the day he knocked out Iron Mike. Uh, that was a really fun interview to do with James. Buster Douglas. Also, the legendary boxing trainer, Teddy Atlas, has stopped by the podcast. So go through the archives of the show. Check out all of the fighters that have been here. Uh, a lot of UFC fighters, too. If you're into the fight game in general, a lot of UFC dads have joined me on the podcast as well. So go check them out and get a copy of Andre Ward's book. Again, the link is down there in the description below. And as always, please help me spread the word about today's podcast. Every father in your neighborhood or in your contact list, let them know about the show that's here celebrating fatherhood and family life. You guys know it. Every day is Father's Day right here on the podcast. And here comes my interview straight up with Andre Ward on First Class Fatherhood. First Class Fatherhood. That is where Alec Lace comes in with his popular podcast. And one of the most interesting was on a podcast. Alec Lace interviews high-profile fathers from actors to NFL players with a vision to change the narrative of fatherhood and family life. All right, joining me now, First Class Father, legendary boxer, Andre Ward. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Man, happy to be on. How are you? Well, it's a pl- I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to have you here. Let's start like this. How many kids do you have? How old? Man, five kids. I got a 22-year-old, 21-year-old, 15-year-old, 11-year-old, and a five-year-old. What's the makeup, boys and girls? Uh, four boys, one girl. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm right there with you just about. I have three boys. Uh, we got our girl on the fourth try, so uh, I didn't quite catch up to you. So uh, <laughs> if you could, Andre, real quick, for those who don't know, just hit them with a little bit about your background. Man, grew up in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, grew up in a single parent household with my father. Um, started boxing at nine years old. And, you know, my first love was actually baseball. I was a pitcher and a shortstop. But then I fell in love with boxing as my dad started telling me stories about his life and about his bo- amateur boxing career. And, man, I've been on this path of boxing, my faith, and starting a family young and trying to build my family for most of my life. And that is my life, right? My faith, my sport. And, and my family. And, and you know, I've, I, I guess I've done enough to put a documentary out and to write a book worth reading and to be doing this interview today. Yeah, well said. I got your book right here, Killing the Image. You're going to get into that in just a second here. Uh, but you said your oldest in your 20s is in his 20s. Now, take me back then to the beginning of your fatherhood journey about how old were you when you first became a dad? Where were you at in your career? And how did that experience change your perspective on life? I had my first child at, at 17 years old and, you know, a shocker. Um, but, you know, I just did a, did an interview before I came on here about, you know, she's the young lady said, well, why didn't you leave? You know, a lot of fathers leave and they're not there. I was like, it just wasn't an option for me. My father didn't leave, even though he was not a perfect man. He struggled with some things, but he was always present. And that's the picture that I had. So though I was scared to death, um, I just knew that we were going to figure this out. And me and Tiffany did. And we began to slowly build our family and build our lives. And, you know, it also, I think having my first child and then my second child a year and a year and some change later, it just really, it helped me because I was struggling at that time. I'm in the streets. I got one foot in boxing, one foot in the streets. And 
my son gave me a deeper purpose in life. Uh, it really helped me to sober up in, in terms of just, you know, realizing that, man, I'm living for something bigger than myself. And it also gave me added motivation that now when I'm going to these tournaments, I have to win now because I got a family to feed. It's not just about winning trophies. Yeah, I love what you say, Andre, because one of the things I focus on so much on this show is the fatherless crisis that we have in our country. We have so many kids that grow up without a father or a father figure in their life. And in my opinion, it's the number one social issue we have plague in this country. And I think that's if we could get more dads and solve this problem of the, the nuclear family unit breaking down and get more positive male role models for these kids, I, I think 90 percent of our problems would go away. I think I think it'd be a lot. I think that would speak to a lot. Um, you know, it's a quote that I have that I've heard that says that if you don't have a vision for your life, the man that doesn't have a vision for his life, he resorts to riotous living. And oftentimes mothers can do it too. And they do it all the time. There's some very, very strong and uh, committed single mothers out there. But I believe that fathers are supposed to be in the home and they are very, very much responsible for helping to give their daughters and sons a visual of what manhood is and also help them with that vision. So when they start to drift off or if they think about drifting off, you can bring them back and say, hey, this is not who you are. This is not how you were raised. This is not the plan that we have. It's not the plan that God has for you. And when you don't have that, you'll tend to stray. Yeah. And the other part of that, too, Andre, is that it, not just the father not being at home, but the heavenly father has been removed from so much of our society. And that's the other component of that that's been removed, too. So those two things together are crippling uh, so many families or so many people in this country. And I wanted to talk to you just about the faith portion. Uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic addict uh, myself. Part of my story goes I once got a lifetime ban from Giant Stadium. Uh, fast forward, I've been invited by the NFL the last six years to go to the Super Bowl, interview the players about fatherhood, faith and family life. So that's kind of the turnaround. And that's all because of my faith faith in God and his work through me. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of get a, a, a picture from you about the, the value of your faith. I know you've had some struggles with addiction as well. Well, your story sounds like redemption to me. Uh, I'll start there. Then, then I'll, I'll just say this. is Look, you're right. The, the world and society is trying to take God out of everything. Um, and for me, I, I'm going to speak about what changed my life, what has sustained my life. And I'm going to do it unapologetically. There's a lot of foolishness that we speak about on the airways, whether it's YouTube, television, uh, social media. We glorify it. We push it. doesn't matter at what expense. We're just going to, you know, hey, this is, this is cool. Let's clap it up. Let's laugh it up. But then when you speak about God, all of a sudden people get a, not everybody, but there's many that get a certain look on their face, a certain tone. And 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 I, I I'm just I don't care like I, I'm not an obnoxious person about my faith I don't subscribe to that either because I feel like sometimes your zeal can kill right your your desire to want to push this this agenda can also push people away I think that we should be living the gospel out as best we can we're not perfect individuals uh, uh, having our lives speak at all times, hopefully, and then only open our mouths when we feel led to or compelled to. But hopefully when we speak, when we share our faith, when we talk about God, it's lined up with what people have seen. That's what I subscribe to and what I try to live by. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, you know, just, just this past Super Bowl, I was there and, and a lot of the guys we're seeing in the NFL, uh, a lot of young guys coming into the league, not being afraid to be bold in their faith. And I think that's so important because so many young men, especially ones that may not have that father figure in their life, look up to guys that are playing in these sports at this, at the professional level. And to hear that kind of message coming, uh, I think has a greater impact than they could ever really know. I agree. And, and so then how, how about as, as far as bringing up your children, what are the top values you had tried to instill in your kids growing up and how big a, uh, importance was faith uh, included in that package? And, and for my children? Yes. I, I think it's what the title of the book is. I think faith is number one, right? Teaching them the value of fighting, not physically fighting, but learning how to fight in life. People think in society and in this world that fighting is just for barbaric people or people who have an appetite for it. For it. We all are fighters or will have to fight at some point in time, right? Whether it's fighting things about yourself that you want to change and don't like, whether it's fighting things that are coming at you in this life, in society, in your family, we all have to fight. And I'm trying to teach my kids how to fight according to the rules. Well, what are the rules? According to what the Bible says and according to what we deem is right and wrong. Um, and the forgiveness piece is very, very big because a lot of this world's issues are individuals that are walking around offended and 
hurt and unwilling to forgive. And that's going to poison you as an individual, as a society. That's where a lot of, you know, the anger and frustration and rage and killing, this stuff comes from, you did this to me. I don't like you because of your race, your religion, your this, your that. And we just haven't learned how to, how to forgive people. Forgiveness is really just releasing a person, like, like pushing away the offense and pushing away what they did to you. And I'm trying to teach my kids and hopefully model this for them. Like, yeah, faith is good. You should have the foundation, right? We got to learn how to fight and fight according to the rules and fight and learn what's right and what's wrong. But forgiveness, and it starts here in your home with your siblings. Hey, our dad may for, may offend you. Mom may forgive Hey, you got to learn how to push that thing away, A, so you can get forgiveness when you need it, but then also so you can stay free from all the bitterness and the things that come with not forgiving. So those are yeah. just three of the pillars that, that I try to teach my kids. Yeah, well said, Andre. And how about as far as uh, discipline goes? Obviously, uh, you, you know, you're a fighter, you're a well-disciplined athlete, but how about as far as discipline goes? How, what type of disciplinarian are you as a dad? And is that different uh, than the discipline style you grew up with? I, I'm a bit of a disciplinarian. My wife's my wife, she, she's not a pushover, but she's, you know, she's not as as much as me. And um, but I've also grown. You know, I think as a younger father, I was more of a disciplinarian. As as I get older, I've learned to um uh, take a beat. And think through things before I before I apply discipline. So I think that you know, me and my two my 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 uh, two oldest sons, we sort of grew up together. And there were some good things that took place, and some things that I wish I could take back. Um, but we've learned together and grew together. And I've just tried to implement those things in my family. And in terms of like compares comparing my childhood versus theirs, um, it's very similar. You know, my dad had, you know, he's a disciplinarian as well, but he also coupled that with a lot of love. And I just think that that's what I try to do. That's what my wife tries to do. We're going to have to get on our kids sometimes and we should. That's also part of what's wrong with society is discipline is not there. It's not just fatherless households. It's when you do something, you got to know that you can't do that because if you begin to believe that this is okay, you're going to continue to do this and do more. And then that's what, that's why they have juvenile halls and, you know, prisons because, People are filling those beds who are committing crimes and doing things they shouldn't be doing. So uh, very similar as my upbringing. And I use a lot of my dad's uh, tactics <laughs> with my kids. Yeah, and we do see that. We do see like uh, uh, disciplining children seems to be looked down upon, especially spanking a child. It seems to be looked at as child abuse today, where it's like there's a monumental difference between spanking a child and beating a child. And, and they've tried to lump that in. And when there's not any consequences and the first consequences you face are with law enforcement or something out there, you don't know how you're not equipped with the skills to handle that because you've never had it in the home. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of stuff going on that, you know, it, you know. I agree. I agree with, with a lot of what you said. And I think that um, you also, you know, equality is not sameness as well with your kids. You got to know, you got to know your child and you got to know, okay, for this one, like some of my kids, I can just look at and they'll be in tears. Right. And the other one I have to take, Hey man, listen, you know, conversating and talking and then hearing them out works for them. And then, so it just depends on the child. You got to, you got to know your kids and you got to know, um, how to how to speak to each one, discipline each one, and and just how to go about it because they're 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 different. Yeah, I mean I'm in the same boat. It's 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 fascinating how they all come from the same place and they all require different styles of discipline. They all have a different love language, and it, it's amazing yeah. how they're that each one is different. And you mentioned your book here, uh, "Killing the Image: A Champion's Journey of Faith, Fighting, and Forgiveness." Uh, link to the book is down in the description below. Uh, w w now, obviously, you had the documentary out. What, what what is different about the book? What are what are people going to learn about you that's different in the book that they're not going to get from the documentary? Well, in the documentary, we touched on some things, but we just can't delve too deep. We only have so much time. In a book, you're getting the full story. Where where any topic or or topic of a chapter that we touch on, we're going all the way to the end of the story, and you're getting the full story, the lessons, and the takeaways, um, and the roadmap to if you're in a similar situation for you to get free or to overcome. And that's the thing, whether I speak to people in person, writing a book or documentary, there, there's so much, so much inspirational speaking out there. And I love it. I think we should inspire people. That's part of the process of being a communicator. But anything that I do, doc speaking or book, I want to inspire, but then give some practical tools and a roadmap to get to the finish line as well. And I use it based on my life. So that's also in the book that, you know, we couldn't really, we sort of told the story in the documentary, but the lessons of how I overcame are fully detailed in this book. 
What was it challenging for you to write the book? Was it was there some moments in your life where it was hard to kind of peel peel back and go back and revisit those uh, those moments? For sure, for sure, there were many days I'm sitting in front of the computer and I'm like, I can't talk about that. Like I had to close the computer and go on about my day, and I would leave it for two or three days, and then I would come back and try to figure it out. And, and a, a, a gentleman, Shaka Singor, he has a, a a wonderful book out right now, a powerful book called Writing, like literally writing my wrongs and uh, grew up in Detroit, you know, the crack epidemic ended up getting a lot of time in prison. And he, he, he developed his love of writing and poetry in prison. And he's just a phenomenal writer. And I would call him. I said, Shaka, man, bro, I'm at this point in my story. I can't talk about this. How did you push through? Or what did you know? How did you know what to share and what not to share about your story? He said, what's right? For me, it was less about not sharing and sharing. And it was more about how do I share? And he said, that's where my creative juice and my gift comes out as a writer. So I think stop looking at it like should I or shouldn't I and just look at it about how I can. So when I would hit those tough moments and those inflection points, I would apply what Shaka said. And I found a way to talk about difficult things, things that I would probably swore to myself at certain points in time that I would never speak about. Give it to the people, but just know how to communicate it. And no doubt you're going to touch a lot of lives with this and inspire people, hopefully uh, in their faith, but also inspire a few people maybe to the ring. So what, what kind of advice do you have for the parents out there that have kids? I mean, the game is a lot different, I think, since you last left it here and the way people are coming up the ranks. What advice would you have to the parent out there that has a child interested in boxing, has the passion for it? Uh, what maybe route or what kind of advice would you give the parent on how to steer the child? Well, first and foremost, make sure it's something that they that they want to do. Um, and you won't fully know that until they get in that gym and start to, you know, smell the smell the smells and hear the sounds. And then obviously start, you know, bumping up against another another kid and seeing if, if, if they're cut out for it. Um, but don't push them into it. This is not the sport for that. Um, know that boxing can be a lonely sport. It's not a team sport. There are no timeouts. There's no oxygen on the sidelines like you see football players. get. You can't stop in the middle and get water. It's a different kind of sport. Just understand that going in. And I wouldn't push a kid or invite a kid to a boxing gym for competition, right? I think probably everybody should do it just for confidence and to learn how to use your hands if you need to and to get in shape. But from a competitive standpoint, you have to see – an extreme work ethic and some talent there and some ability and a willingness to learn. you got some of those initial ingredients, give it a shot. And you can also start off with it and say, hey, this is just for self-defense and for you to just, you know, gain some confidence and we'll see where it goes. But don't push a kid into this sport with this vision of them being an all-time great because your kid, you take punishment in boxing. And that's this is it's just not the sport for a parent to be trying to live through their kid. Yeah. Great stuff, Andre. And obviously, uh, you, you dominated the sport. You finished undefeated. Uh, you're, you, you know, you a uh, Hall of Famer. You're a legendary boxer. So your your legacy uh, in the boxing world is secure. But what would you say you want your legacy as a father to be? Man, that I showed up every day. Um, I'm okay with saying that I'm not a perfect parent, but I hope that my children see me own my mistakes when I make them, and I hope that I'm making you know more better decisions than I than I'm than I'm not. And I just hope they feel loved. I hope they 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 just see my efforts, man. You know, I just hope that they see me and my wife. But I'm just speaking about me right now. Just my efforts as a father. And I hope that there are tangible things that they can take away and say, my dad showed me this and I and I and I caught that. And now I'm implementing it. My dad taught me this. My dad exemplified this. So um yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be bad. You know, we're not perfect, perfect people as, as fathers, but I hope they when they look at my my fatherhood in its totality i hope they feel good about it yeah great stuff last thing i want to hit you with here andre i love to ask all the dads that i get on the podcast what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening well invite god into the situation because you're gonna need it we don't know what we're doing and what we should do and how we should do it we think we do but we don't so you need guidance there and uh you know be better than what you got your dad may have been a, a great father still try to be better than that keep trying to Cause the legacy to grow and be better and better and better with each generation. And in uh, all that you do, right? Disciplining, trying to be an example, trying to be a provider. Love the way you love your child when they make mistakes, when they do good, whether they are first place, last. The love is something that they will never, ever forget. And, and that's the main thing. Love them. Love your children. Well said. I love the message. Uh, killing the image. 
available now. I have the link in the description down below. Andre Ward, you're a first class father all the way. Thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, brother. Anytime. Thank you. Alec Lace has interviewed more than 700 dads on his award-winning podcast, First Class Fatherhood. Dads from all walks of life, including Tom Brady, Deion Sanders, Matthew McConaughey, Steve Harvey, Tony Hawk, Eric Trump, and so many more. Find out why First Class Fatherhood has been number one on the iTunes charts. Who these men are as fathers and how they raise their children is far more important than anything they accomplish in their careers. Alec Lace encourages his high-profile guests to share their fatherhood journeys and offer advice to new and soon-to-be dads. Let every father in your contact list know about First Class Fatherhood. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Every day is Father's Day on First Class Fatherhood.